<laughs> okay, great. Well, first of all, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here and hopefully we'll have a few more people joining us in just a little bit. So my name is Kim Klett. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Educators Institute for Human Rights. Founded by teachers for teachers, EIHR supports communities recovering from uh, violent conflict. We do this by applying lessons from the Holocaust and other genocides, such as the Rwandan genocide, as a starting point for teaching secondary school students about how these conflicts evolve and how to prevent them. Today's program is one of a series focused on issues around the human rights of children and issues that affect children today. Please watch our social media sites for other programs in the new year. So at EIHR, we not only study human rights atrocities abroad, but also those here in the United States. Thus, we begin our webinars with a land acknowledgement. Today we're in Maryland on Susquehannock land. The Susquehannock unfortunately do not exist on this land anymore as they were killed by epidemic. Mm -hmm. And if you can mute yourself, please. Um, they were killed by epidemics and war, massacred by whites and flamed by accounts of an Indian war. While that tribe is not on this land today, learn more about the land you live on at nativeland.ca. And I'll put that in the chat in just a minute. We are presenting this acknowledgement in remembrance of the true indigenous history of this land, in feeling the presence and diversity of indigenous people today, and in starting, or sorry, stating our solidarity with indigenous activists in reconstructing our vocabulary, honoring indigenous cultures, and advocating for lasting reparations for indigenous people, return of their land, past, present, and future. I would now like to welcome back Olivia Wells and Abed Shamden from Nadia's initiative. I know some of you joining today met them at our uh, first webinar with them a few months ago. So I'll let them introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, I do wanna point out that we have set up today's program as a meeting. And so Olivia and Abed would love to hear your questions. So when you do have a question, please feel free to unmute, turn your camera on and ask your question. And then when you're not speaking, just please return to mute so that we avoid some background noise. So Olivia and Abed, thank you so much for, for being with us again. And um, since we have some people new to us this time and some people who were with us last time, do you wanna just give us kind of an update of what's happening in the UCD community today? Um, some of the th difficulties they're still facing, some of the successes, what, what's going on now? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I'll introduce myself quickly and then turn it over to my colleague Abed, um, who is a member of the Yazidi community and is best place, I think, to speak about this. Um, my name is Olivia Wells. I'm the Director of Programs and Partnerships at Nadi's Initiative. Uh, my background is in um, community-led sustainable development and also international criminal law with a focus on prevention of sexual violence and conflict. Over to you, Abed. Thanks, Olivia. Um, good morning, good evening. Uh, we're this evening here almost. Um, it's good to be with you again. Um, uh, my name is Abed Shemdin. I'm the executive director of Nadia's initiative, as Olivia mentioned. Um, I was born and raised in Sinjar and then later uh, moved to the United States and I've been involved um, in helping uh, the survivors of, of genocide and sexual violence from the Yazidi community. Um, since uh, 2014. Abba, do you want to tell a little bit about what it looks like for the community today? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, it's, um, what is what does it look like? Um, it's been over seven years since, you know, these events took place, uh, a genocide um, as a, it has been called by the UN and many countries have recognized it as a genocide. Um, it's been over seven years now um, as a small group um, that was indigenous to that region um, in Iraq 
um, Syria, Turkey, um, but specifically in Sinjar, um, you know, focusing on the events that took place in 2014. Um, at the moment, the Yazidi community is still uh, scattered. Um, the majority uh, is still living in, in the camps. Um, about, I, I, I would say, around 60% of the total population in Iraq is still living in camps inside their own country after seven years. Um, um, you know, the number, the, the, the percentage of, of, of folks that have returned to Sinjar, uh, I would say around 30%, Olivia, 40-ish uh, percent. Uh, those, you know, this is the percentage of people in total that remained in Iraq. Um, those that have returned to Sinjar um, are facing many challenges. And this is exactly what, why Nadia's initiative was founded by Nadia Murad. And this is exactly what we are focusing on in terms of programs and advocacy in Iraq and uh, the region, aside from our global advocacy around uh, uh, raising awareness about um, uh, communities that are facing danger and sexual violence. Those that have returned are facing many challenges, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of access to services, but also some of the challenges that actually led to this genocide uh, in the first place. Uh, a conflict between different groups that are, you know, are dis disputing um, over the control of, of the region um, in terms of uh, geography, but also in terms of people um, and what those votes um, in every election as it just happened in Iraq uh, a few weeks ago can get them. And this has been the situation since 2014, uh, three. After the US invasion, uh, the region has been um, uh, categorized as a disputed region because of the uh, Article 140 of the Iraqi constitution that refers to some areas as disputed areas and would be um, ultimately voted on by residents of these areas uh, to decide whether to go with the Kurdistan region of the Iraq or the Iraqi Republic. The invasion and the aftermath of the invasion was you know, thought to be bringing democracy to Iraq, but in fact, I was just telling Olivia the other day that since 2003, there has been no election in, in Sinjar. We have never had any local um, election. Uh, the mayor, the local council, uh, sub-district mayors, and, and the entire system of local governance in Iraq has always been appointed by different, by political parties ha that have dominated the region since 2003. And um, to backtrack, and now, you know, this, and this is exactly what led to uh, what happened in 2014. Um, uh, because the area was disputed, it was under-resourced, uh, uh, security was fragile, and, um, and it left a, a vacuum for ISIS and other militia groups to ex uh, exploit and take advantage of. And, and, and you know, they committed the, these uh, atrocities against Yazidis. Um, killing thousands of people, um, yeah, taking thousands of women and children into captivity, um, some of which uh, are still in captivity. Uh, we are speaking about uh, more than 87 or 86 mass graves that have been uh, so far discovered. Um, most, of, most of those are not, have not been yet exhumed. Um, uh, bodies have, uh, the majority of the bodies have not been identified. Um, and again, the, the security is not uh, stable because of these disputes between different groups and which ultimately leads to lack of um, investment in Sinjar and reconstruction after what ISIS did. Uh, as you might know, they destroyed schools, they left behind um, explosives, um, they destroyed clinics, uh, agriculture, and the entire system that was set up, um, you know, by this community for centuries. You know, the, the system that we had in place that helped us 
survive. Um, but at the same time, uh, the UN and others are using uh, some of these um, things that I mentioned as an excuse not to invest in Sinjar. Uh, we are investing, it's possible to do it. Um, and you know, we, have, we have proved that it's possible to, to get things done there. Um, in terms of, in general, the, those that remain in the camps, uh, they are safe in these camps. Uh, from a security perspective, but you know, you now you have a generation of people that lived um, uh, in in these camps for for years, and um, you have children that were born in these camps that have seen nothing outside these camps. You have um, children that were brought to these camps where they were in, when they were five and six, and now are teenagers and they don't know anything outside of these camps. And so the aftermath of, gen of this genocide is actually destroying the Yazidi community. Um, and this is why sometimes we say the genocide is ongoing because of these factors. Um, and, you know, we have called again and again that and said that the the living conditions and keeping people in these camps uh, is not sustainable. And we can see that um, today uh, we were just uh, in Lithuania um, to see the Yazidi refugees there. There are hundreds of Yazidis in Poland. In fact, just an hour ago, I heard from those in Belarus. They said that we have been uh, told that we will be uh, returned to Iraq uh, in two days. And so because they have kept them in these camps and this, they were not, uh, they have not been able to return to their homes and, and, and resume their lives and, and start a normal life again. And the Iraqi government also um, have not helped people rebuild their homes and the property they lost. Um, people are starting to, you know, just look for ways to get to Europe and, the, you know, um, with the recent crisis uh, in, in Belarus and these different borders, hundreds, if not thousands of Yazidis also are among those, uh, those folks. And now the government of Belarus and the Iraqi government are um, arrang arranging uh, flights to return them home, actually not home to these camps. Um, so it, it's, um, it's very sad to, to see after all these years that uh, uh, the community struggling to uh, be able to recover and restore their lives um, uh, in terms of justice. Um, many of you might have saw that recently Germany convicted an, uh, an ISIS member uh, for genocide and crimes against humanity because he uh, was involved in the enslavement of Yazidi woman, uh, killed her child, and abused her. Um, but this is just one. Imagine one single ISIS member has been convicted of genocide and crimes and uh, sexual slavery that took place against thousands of Yazidis. And there are, we know, there are thousands of ISIS members that are in Europe. Uh, some of them have returned to the US even. Um, in Iraq, both in Baghdad and Erbil, there are uh, thousands in custody, but have not, have not been uh, put on trial for specific crimes against the Yazidi community. And so um, with that, um, I will turn it over to Olivia, or if Olivia, if I forgot something, um, you can continue from here maybe, or if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, Kim, I'll just add a little bit and then the, we want to make sure we let people um, ask questions if they have any. But uh, I, I think one thing that's really important to, to circle back on here and is, is we incorporated a lot into the language we use around why we're doing this work. And Abed said it already is that I think often, you know, probably when I was taught about genocides that had happened in the world, I, you're really taught about it or in the past at least, um, as, as a singular event, right? 
And it's it's very much not that. Um, and, and that's why we use the language around, you know, the fact that the genocide is ongoing because the community, we I think a lot of people talk about Iraq as like, it's post-conflict, ISIS is gone, ISIS is not gone. Um, you know, every, we're now in the stages of rebuilding, but the key thing here is that the community can't even really move towards rebuilding because of all these different pieces that Abed just mentioned. And I think it's also important to highlight that the genocide, you know, the, the marginalization of the Yazidi community was happening even before Saddam Hussein. It's been happening for centuries and it's been through targeted violence and resource deprivation. And it, I think it's important to look at that as well um, because it, it paints a more holistic picture of what the community has had to deal with um, over the centuries. And it paints a better picture of why they were so susceptible to, you know, including the fact that everyone abandoned them, both federal Iraq and the KRG abandoned the Yazidis. But there's also a reason why what happened to them happened and why they, they were so susceptible to what was going on. It's because they had already been marginalized and made vulnerable through the Saddam Hussein regime and previous regimes. I'll stop there, Kim, though. And, and uh, if anyone has additional questions, we're here. Great. Um, so I do have some questions, but I want to open it up to the others first. So um, if anybody has a question you would like to ask, feel free to turn on your camera and unmute and uh, ask away. Matthew, it looks like you're ready. Hi, yes. Um, Olivia, thank you for mentioning resource deprivation as a, as a um, motive behind um, genocide. I don't think we often think about that as a, as a, as a way, you know, to pursue this atrocity. Um, <clears throat> Abed, I guess my question is, you know, you brought up the, the recent trial in Germany. Um, is, do you, does Nadia's initiative feel like with this, um, with the success, successful prosecution of this case, that maybe um, there is a, a goal forward in seeking justice and, and maybe restoration? I, I mean, it is only one individual, but um, given that it's been so many years, do you feel like it brings it back into the current political sphere that maybe there's a, a way forward? Yeah, well, so we, we've never given up um, on um, the idea of that, you know, justice, uh, is possible and justice should be uh, done. And, and this is why Nadia has advocated the Nadia's initiative uh, to um, establish UNITAD work with you know, Nadia work for about two years to get the UN Security Council to pass a resolution to create UNITAD, which is um, uh, their mandate is to unfortunately only uh, collect evidence. Um, that evidence is is being collected, and and they have plenty um, of evidence, um, specifically around Sinjar and what happened there, uh, testimonies of survivors, uh, documents, uh, contracts that were used to uh, buy and sell easy women and children. Uh, they have thousands and thousands of documents that can be used um, in in any court uh, anywhere. And they're ready to provide that to the US, to European countries and other places. And I believe they did provide some of that uh, information in this particular case and, and, and others. The, um, yes, you know, it's slow, unfortunately, very slow. The process is, 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 is turning, um, the wheel is turning, but it's, it's very slow. Um, uh, but we will not give up. We will try to, uh, we'll continue to push um, for the idea of universal uh, jurisdiction, which Germany used to convict this particular, um, uh, this guy was, uh, this ISIS member was from Iraq. He's an Iraqi who uh, committed crimes against Yazidis in Syria and Raqqa, and then later went back to Iraq and Fallujah, and then uh, went to Greece, and then Germany did the right thing and they uh, captured him uh, because information was available and put him on trial. You know, uh, obviously it, it makes sense um, that other countries do the same. 
but I, I really, it's at times we don't understand why they don't do it. Why? What is the reason? You have all the evidence you need. Um, both publicly, it's available. Obviously, I've, ISIS bragged about um, their use of genocide um, in, in crimes against Yazidis and enslavement of Yazidi women. They bought and sold them online. So we have that public evidence, but also um, sort of you know legal evidence collected by this you know professional team, um, and they're ready to supply that evidence to uh, you know in Maryland where you know some of you are. If there is a court there, there is an ISIS member, a, a U.S. national that joined them, they can request that evidence and use it against them. Um, we still, you know, we have hoped that the, some of the European countries at least are moving in the uh, right direction. Netherlands, uh, Germany has been leading um, uh, the way for the European countries. Uh, France, I believe, have started a few trials. Um, but this is exactly what we're trying to get done uh, now that we are at this point where we have plenty of evidence available. Um, we have testimonies of survivors. We have survivors in Canada, Australia, uh, Germany, uh, and France and other places. They're ready to uh, appear in court as this um, uh, victim did and, and provide their testimonies to put ISIS on trial. But um, again, it, it, we think it's possible, but um, it's uh, disappointing how slow the process is. And I think also, uh, Matthew, just to add, um, it justice is really, I mean, we work a lot with survivors and we do our team in Iraq does a lot of community outreach. Justice is always across the board, the number one wish of all survivors. Um, and it's so, I think it's become so clear to us that we can do all the work that we're doing to rebuild Sanjar and enable people to return safely and move past that survival mode to thrive thriving. That's kind of what we're trying to do there to not only build back the services that ISIS destroyed, but create better services. Because remember, this community has been marginalized intentionally. So they even before ISIS came in, they didn't have quality education systems, healthcare systems. So we can do all of that. And it's super important. And we want to see more people do that. But at the end of the day, the survivors aren't going to be able to move towards healing. The community is not going to be able to move towards collective healing if justice isn't pursued. And Ab, I mean, Abed said it. We don't understand. There's this with certain countries, there's just a lack of political will to hold ISIS perpetrators accountable. And the thing is, it's not only important for survivors to heal, it's also signals that impunity will not be tolerated. And it's a form of prevention of future crimes. So we would like to, I would like to, I know Abed would too, like to see the international community take this more seriously. And like Abed said, the evidence is there. Everything's there. They just have to take that next step. And I'm, I'm hopeful that Germany is really leading by example in this case. And hopefully others will see what they've done and, and move in the right direction. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. Does anybody else have a question you would like to ask? I have a question. Go ahead, Colleen. Can you hear me, Kim? Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to turn my camera on because I'm in my car. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so my question is, it's really for my students because we studied, we read excerpts of Nadia's book this year and we watched the film and we used it to contextualize the history of the Holocaust. And one of the things that really struck my students was the difference between how raw her testimony and her talking about her, her situation was compared to like Holocaust survivors who told their stories, you know, 30, 40, sometimes 50 years later or more. And so their question was, how is she? How is she today? Um, how is she healing? How is she dealing with this? Um, we, you know, we, I explained to them the work that she's doing, but they really were sort of digging in on, you know, personally, how is she? Um, and how does she get through every day? And so that's what they want to know. And I want to be able to go back to them and tell them, here's what I know. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, that's actually a really um, 
sweet of them to ask about that and her well-being that's that's really nice and, and um wise of them to ask and, and nadia is uh it, look i you know for someone who's lost um her mother six of her brothers her friends her teachers her uh, neighbors and those to survive uh, from her family and others uh, most of them are displaced um, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to continue, but it's also important to continue. I cannot speak for her. I never do. And I don't want to speak for her or any other woman. Um, it's always good that they speak uh, for themselves. Um, but um, it, it, she um, is laser focused on, again, the idea that um, Olivia mentioned justice. Uh, why, you know, should we let ISIS um, free and, and, and give them uh, impunity uh, for these crimes they committed. And, and, she, and I've heard her because I translate for her a lot, not, not so much recently because her English is um, significantly improved. Um, and she says, when, when, I, when we provided our testimonies, uh, you, you know, meaning the survivors of sexual violence, especially, um, they expected you know, justice. That's why they came forward and provided their testimonies, not because they just wanted to be um, on the internet or somewhere providing their testimonies. Um, it's not easy to repeat these stories, but they do it because they want uh, first uh, and, and justice for the specific crime, but, but also to uh, hopefully help prevent that from happening against any other uh, women anywhere in the world. So um, I, she's doing well. Uh, she's in school now, um, uh, you know, taking classes um, in between these, you know, trips and, and meetings and, and work. Um, so she's doing great. And um, hopefully we can get her to uh, chat with your students at some point. Well, you were, you were definitely reading my mind because that was my next question. Is um, is she available to speak? And you know, certainly I can be in touch about that because, you know, her. I think this generation of students, you know, they're so unaware of so many things. And I think that when I talked about some of the relevance of this story in class, they were completely shocked by it. And I think we have to capitalize on that. Um, and I think more so, I think this is a great venue for that for teachers who teach this subject, because her story is is has to be told and it has to be understood in the way that you're talking about it, seeking justice and what that means and what the mechanisms are for that and how to teach kids, you know, especially in the United States, the importance and the value of that. So your work is certainly very, very important to our classrooms, that's for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, um, and and it's, I've heard Nadia say many times, I, I wrote this book because we need to document. We need to document what happened, uh, not just speak it because we might forget about it when we cannot certainly she cannot and the survivors especially cannot continue to repeat their stories you know for uh many many years to come it, it's even if they do it's good to have something documented that this group of terrorists uh, did this um against you know this community and in women especially they use them um, they used them against the entire community um, and, and bought and sold them as, as they were, you know, uh, objects. And so um, it, the book is, is, is very important to her. And she said, she said it many times that it's, it's the most important thing that she thinks that she put together to uh, document these crimes. And uh, she's very proud of it as well. And I was very disappointed that they, I'm, I'm sure you've read, read the stories in, in Canada recently. There was a, you know, a school board that um, um, somehow said that, you know, we shouldn't use this book uh, because it might promote uh, Islamophobia. Apparently they had not read the book at all. They just read the title and because it said the uh, Islamic State, which is a terrorist group, uh, they said that, you know, it shouldn't be used. And um, exactly what you said, uh, Colleen, that, uh, you know, young women, especially in the U.S. and Canada and these places should know about what happens to women elsewhere. Uh, 
uh, the fight is is one and uh, awareness is is our goal. We're, we're just trying to raise awareness. Pauline, I uh, also put Abed and I's emails into the chat if you need to contact us in the future. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think that's one of the things for a lot of us. And then Tanya, I'll get your question. I saw you were trying to get on there. Um, that I think it does, you know, a lot of us teach about the Holocaust and that there are, I know as I was reading the book, there are so many similarities and I just kept marking things that my students would relate to. And I think like Colleen said, this is a good way, you know, once we've taught the Holocaust to, to show our students that this doesn't end. Um, that this is ongoing and something that we need to work against. So thank you for that, Colleen. Um, Tanya, did you have a question? Or anybody else? I wanna make sure we get everybody's questions answered. Okay, well, don't be shy. If anybody wants to ask again, you're welcome to. Um, I wanted to mention too that at the beginning of the book, um, I was really appreciative of the fact that Nadia includes a lot of background about the Yazidis because I really didn't know much about the community before, you know, before I started reading about it in the news. And even then you don't get much background. And again, as a Holocaust educator, we like to use, you know, Jewish life before the Holocaust and, and show our students who are these people and what were their lives like before they were, you know, so, so tragically affected. Um, and so I think that's a really good um, um, aspect of the book that I appreciated. Um, is that something that is still, you know, promoted within Nadia's initiative and, you know, just, um, I think, showing people, you know, a little bit about the background and is that still an important part of that to, to get across to people? Abed, do you want to answer that? <laughs> um, yes, I, in fact, the, I think the most important uh, part of, if, you know, what Nadia is doing, um, and what we did, especially in the beginning, was to explain to people who Yazidis were and why this happened, because it didn't make sense. Even if you were in a meeting um, for one hour, an hour and a half at the most, uh, government officials especially, you talk about the history of this genocide and what happened. And then uh, you, you, know, you talk about the Yazidis um, by end of the meeting, they would say, are Yazidis, you know, a, a, a different type of Muslims or are the Yazidi, you know, so it, it, it was really difficult to get people to know who Yazidis are and why they are being resource de deprived, like Olivia mentioned, um, okay. why they're being marginalized, why they've been persecuted and why I said to, did this to Yazidis specifically in, in 2014. And yes, um, absolutely. Um, our global advocacy uh, work is focused on raising awareness about Yazidis uh, and prevention of genocide in general um, and prevention of, of sexual violence against women um, in general. And also, Kim, um, we we do um, quite a bit. Uh, what you you probably because you, I think you follow us on our social media uh, channels. We we utilize videos quite a bit to show the impact of the projects we're doing, but we also utilize uh, videos and other forms of graphics to teach about uh, Yazidi customs, holidays, just so people can learn more about the community. And I saw that uh, Kate shared our, our uh, booklet, which I think is a really nice resource because it also gives a background about who the community are. So we, we try to weave that into every single narrative around the work we're doing. And um, Kate put a, a question in the chat box. Uh, do you have more thoughts on the statement on the events in Germany last week? Um, and there's a link there. Oh, this, uh, Abed, this is about, she linked uh, Nadia and Amal's uh, statement on the, the genocide conviction. 
Okay, sorry. I, I the question is, what are what are our thoughts on this this conviction, this historic conviction um, of oh, the? Obviously, it was uh, very important, and um, we were very much hoping that this will be um, a model for other countries to uh, put ISIS members on trial, at least those that have uh, uh, come back to Europe and again to the U.S. and, and other places. Um, the entire Yazidi community was uh, happy to see uh, that trial, the outcome of that trial. Um, in fact, the woman, um, the victim, and the little girl that was killed by this ISIS member, um, she had a disability. Um, you know, I, I, Olivia, maybe uh, there was more about this case uh, I shared with you. Maybe drop it in the box too. Uh, provides the details of this case. Uh, it, it, it's it's heartbreaking, um, but it it was um, uh, for the first time. It it just gave us some hope that um, uh, you know what Matthew asked earlier that yes, it is possible to put these um, ISIS uh, terrorists on trial. It's possible to at least um, you know see justice in in some places. Um, obviously, putting in the entire uh, system of ISIS on trial and all of those that joined them uh, would take a lot of time, uh, but individual cases are very important. Thank you. Um, I wanted to use a, a quote from the book. Um, it's on page 52, if anybody has their books, where um, Nadia talks about, uh, she says, I still think that being forced to leave your home out of fear is one of the worst injustices a human being can face. Everything you love is stolen and you risk your life to live in a place that means nothing to you and where, because you come from a country now known for war and terrorism, you are not really wanted. So you spend the rest of your years longing for what you left behind while praying not to be deported. And so I was thinking about what you were saying earlier about you know, life um, in these camps, uh, um, internally displaced. And then in On Her Shoulders, she visits a, a camp in Greece or a couple of camps in Greece. Um, and I know you were talking about the difficulties in getting back because of the way the government systems work, but do, do you see that happening um, eventually? Will that happen? Will people be able to return home? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, that's our hope um, and we're exactly what we're doing um, is focused on the homeland. That's why we have not done a single project in these camps because we think these camps are toxic and they're destroying the Yazidi community from within. And this is another type of, of genocide against the community. Um, th these camps are um, tents that were set up in 2014 and they're fenced like people are living in a fenced community it's like a prison um, and this is why we are 100 percent in Iraq focused on the homeland trying to rebuild schools clinics uh, wash uh, farms especially and in other livelihood um, in, in Sinjar so that those that have returned can uh, not only survive but uh, thrive and you know, create an environment um, that makes it possible for those that uh, want to return uh, can return. Um, and it, it's challenging um, because uh, we're almost, you know, especially in the beginning, we're, we were alone. Um, now we're, we've gotten some people to join us in, in this effort to focus on the, the right solutions, the sustainable solutions, but uh, yes, absolutely. That's our goal. And, and we're 100% focused on that because um, as we can see, again, going back to the recent migrant crisis in Belarus and, and other places, people are not letting Yazidis in and they're not giving them asylum. Therefore, they have no other choice but either to live in these camps or go back to their homeland, which you know we know uh, from these years of people living in the camps, the suicide rates have gone up. The, entire community structure has been uh, dismantled. So um, yes, uh, our hope is that it's possible and we're gonna continue to do everything we can to um, uh, bring back services and to also empower women, especially we've been focused on that uh, 
you know, uh, establishing uh, small businesses for women so that they can have their own um, source of income and, 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 and empower them. Also, just to add to that, Kim, um, that people have been returning um, despite all of this. Uh, there's close to 150,000 Yazidis who have returned to Sinjar. Um, this, we actually saw last summer a sort of a spike in, in returns because for obvious reasons, people didn't want to be stuck in these cramped uh, camps when a pandemic was happening. Um, and but I think the the what we you know what we see happening is that people because you know families are separated. There are families back in Sinjar in the camps in Australia, Canada, uh, Germany, and the ones who are in Sinjar are communicating with families who are in the camps, say, literally saying. Nadia's initiative, this organization, this organization, they're, they're working on this village. They're going to get the primary health center, clean water, and a school up and running. And that incentivizes people to return. But the problem is we still have, and this is why we take a really holistic approach to our work, where it's not just the projects, but all the advocacy work that Abed's been talking about, particularly around secure, improving security and local governance. It's really critical Again, we want to reduce the marginalization and vulnerability of this community. And one way to do that is to empower them to govern themselves, which Abin mentioned really right at the beginning that it just hasn't, elections haven't happened. This hasn't been the case. But another thing that's an issue is you have, you know, Turkey and, and their, 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 you know, fight with with PKK and and so there there are still security issues that are hindering that return and that's exactly why we work on security because we're we're trying to rebuild Sinjar but at the same time we need to make sure that it's safe and for people to have a dignified and sustainable return. Thank you. Um, Tanya put in the chat box uh, what was the motivating factor that kept Nadia going during the genocide? I think during um, her experience. Yeah, again, I, I hate to answer for her uh, these specific questions. I would leave it uh, definitely for her. Hopefully sometimes she can, uh, she has definitely answered these questions in some of the um, events. So um, I probably know uh, because I've, yeah, but I, 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 again, I don't wanna speak for her. Based on what she shared with you, can you answer it? Based on what she has, based on what Nadia has shared with you, can you respond from that perspective? I can definitely yes. Um, I based on what she shared with me, and she answered this specific question uh, in the past at, at you know several events is that. Um, seeing what happened to Yazidis happened for no reason other than just being Yazidi. Uh, you know, they were attacked. Um, um, her community and other communities around her, um, as she mentioned, her friends, family, and others, the people that were hardworking people, uh, peaceful people that have not harmed their neighbors or anyone, were attacked brutally and men were killed, disabled people were killed. Uh, on the spot uh, on August 3rd, 2014. And uh, thousands of women were gathered and children were taken into captivity. She always says that uh, what happened to us uh, shouldn't have happened and it shouldn't happen to anyone else. And this is why it's important again for justice and for future deterrence of, of genocide in, in, in these kind of events. And as a woman also, uh, and I've heard her say that you know, using Yazidi women uh, to uh, as a weapon against the community um, and to fuel their own uh, war in Iraq and Syria. Um, it, it's 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 her mother that she said that you know what happened to her mother and, and, and her family and others that drive her uh, drives her to continue the fight because it, it, it's just not right. What happened shouldn't. Um, pass uh, without being heard and without being addressed. Thank you. And I see a question from Caroline in the chat box as well. So for the people who are returning, um, 
Olivia, I think you said earlier that obviously ISIS is still there. Are any of them, you know, worried about living among perpetrators? Abba, do you want to answer that? Or I, I can as well, but I think you have a better idea. Um, so are, are Yazidis who've returned to, to Sinjar concerned about living in close proximity to neighbors who we know took part um, in what was happening? Um, yes, uh, it, it is a concern because unfortunately, uh, and I say this, um, you know, we lived with uh, some communities around Sinjar for decades, if not centuries, um, traded uh, with one another, some of them at least that uh, uh, were, you know, working with Yazidis and uh, they knew Yazidis were a peaceful community, their neighbors, and they joined ISIS when ISIS attacked um, and helped them capture Yazidi women and men that were killed. So, and took over uh, all the property that Yazidis had, uh, their livelihood, their uh, livestock, their farms and, and, and everything. Um, it, it's, it's, it is a concern, one that, again, just in the terms of justice and those that joined have not been put on trials. And so um, that's, that's, yes, that's a big concern. Um, on the other hand, in Iraq, you don't know who's who and who did what, uh, which, is, which is problematic. You know, um, if you joined ISIS and, and you, know, you say, well, I, I just joined to cook or to clean, or, you know, everyone, of course, says that. Um, there's no system in place to say, okay, well, let's see uh, who did what, and especially especially the enslavement of thousands of women and children. Um, those that were involved in, in this trade and this enslavement have not been categorized as such. And so, uh, yes, unfortunately, um, some high-profile ISIS members are in prison, some high-profile ISIS members are um, thought to be released from prison recently. I just to add here, I, I think um, the, this is a good question because it's it's like Abed said, it's something that is obviously very concerning for the community, and it's something similar to what what we saw in Rwanda, right, where neighbors were killing neighbors, and so I think you know, uh, obviously justice at an international level is uh, really, really critical. What, what's happened, what happened in Germany is critical. We want to see other countries do that. But at some point, you know, in the process of rebuilding, um, reconciliation is really going to come into play. And I think that there, there will be, need to be something similar in Sinjar and elsewhere to what we saw in Rwanda post-genocide. Um, and in South Africa with the truth-telling commissions, um, because otherwise, I mean, I, if I was a Yazidi, I would, and knowing that my neighbors did that, there's got to be some kind of reconciliation on a grassroots level to enable the community to move truly towards healing. And that um, leads me to another question, because um, when Nadia was in the book, um, when she was in Mosul, um, she had that family who helped her um, when she escaped. And I wonder, you know, now for Olivia, you said the 150,000 who have returned, are they finding people to be, you know, a little more helpful or are they still facing the hostility that they faced before? Abed, you probably know that better. Is there still a lot of hostility for those in, in Sinjar, in particular, I'd say? Um, you know, the, let me go one step back. Um, in 2003 and in, in, in between 2003 and 10, thousands of Yazidis um, joined, um, they uh, applied for jobs and got hired with the US military to help them in their translators, uh, welders, cleaners, and security and others, including myself. Uh, I worked for the military for five years. And that's how I got to the US. Um, 
because Yazidis were peaceful, because Yazidis were trustworthy, you know, and they hired them and, and because others refused, you know, most of them refused to, to do that and help. Um, Sinjar has always been a stable region uh, other than us being targeted by others. Um, so north and south of Sinjar are uh, these, you know, uh, two uh, parallel to the mountain, it's um, all Yazidi villages and towns. Uh, they are, you know, from 2003 to 2010 and 11 and until 2014, uh, Iraq has always been, um, there has been always, you know, uh, ISIS or Al Qaeda or other terrorist groups in, in Mosul and other places. Um, you can't find that among Yazidi villages and towns because they don't join these such groups. Um, in 2007, Yazidis were targeted, you know, with uh, large semi trucks of of explosive by Al Qaeda, you know, that killed hundreds of Yazidis and injured uh, thousands. Uh, almost destroyed an entire town uh, in the south side of Mount Sinjar. Um, the region, our region, is safe and now even it, it's 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 stable but the threat is from the outside you don't know when it's coming and where from and who um so you're always on uh alert that um you uh are a target and so it, this is the reason that the uh, uh, the security forces were not from the easy community in 2014 and that's why um what happened happened because they didn't uh, fight ISIS or even try to give civilians a chance to uh, escape. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, a good percentage of the security uh, are Yazidis, though it's not organized very well because um, of the fact that these different militia groups after ISIS was uh, driven out from the area, they just um, to control different uh, pockets of, uh, of the region and they refuse to let go. Um, so it, it's relatively stable. Um, it's uh, possible to, to invest, to do work, um, to, um, for those that have returned. Um, and just at the moment, there is a lot of ISIS activities in Kharkov and other places, but not so much in that specific region yet. I'm going to add one more thing because I think it's really important. Abed and I are always, um, we, we, we get frustrated with people who perpetuate this narrative that Sinjar is incredibly dangerous. It's like the most dangerous. And, and I recognize that I mentioned earlier about the Turkish airstrikes and there are of course issues, but like Abed said, they're all external to the actual region. Um, but I, I do want to illustrate that um, uh, the U.S. Institute for Peace released a, a survey, which was quite comprehensive um, earlier this year, which showed in a you know sort of graphic way perceptions of safety um, among residents in Sinjar, and I believe it was around seventy three percent of the community found Sinjar to either be incredibly safe or somewhat safe. That's a pretty large amount. So again, the the we just need to allow Yazidis, we need to enable Yazidis to self-govern and be integrated into the security forces, and that's going to reduce their marginalization. So if something happens again in terms of what happened in 2014, hopefully it will never happen again, but you have to be prepared. They'll be better positioned to protect themselves. Thank you. Um, unless anybody else has a question, I'll ask the last one. Um, since uh, the book was written, uh, Nadia won the Nobel Peace Prize. And has that been helpful in this work? Um, has it helped, you know, get her story out more and, and the story of the Yazidis? Um, has, how, has that, how has that affected the work of all what you do and, and what she's doing? Sorry, you mean uh, her winning the, the Nobel Peace Prize? Okay, um, it certainly has helped um, in terms of, 
you know, given her a platform to use to raise awareness and to connect with governments and, and individuals even and, and others um, and to get, you know, more support to Sinjar and to talk about this specific topic of sexual violence and conflict. Um, but I think also at the same time, it's like, okay, if, you know, you win the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, you've made it, that's it. Um, you're set, but that, you know, at times we struggle to get, you know, the government to do something in Iraq. We, at times we struggle to get them to give and even get, give us permissions to do a project that we have gotten funding for and designed and ready to implement. Um, it, it's so, yes, and in many ways it has helped, um, uh, you know, provide that platform and, and get the story out, um, uh, uh, that that helps us, you know, people know who Nadia is, people know who Yazidis are uh, more than ever. Um, but at the same time, it's also like, okay, the story of the Yazidis is old uh, to many people. It happened seven, eight years ago. You know, Nadia as a person has won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, maybe we should move on to the next topic, uh, but they don't know the reality most time on the ground that people are still displaced. These things are still ongoing. I'll add one small thing to that. Um, I think it's really good to remind people that, you know, there's there's a massive, massive weight on, on Nadia's shoulders um, as a survivor and, and as a, a, a Nobel Peace Laureate. Um, and, you know, as Abed mentioned, uh, she, she's doing, she's fighting the fight for her community um, for her family, but it's it's uh, it's a massive weight to to put on anyone's shoulders. And I think why I'm highlighting this is because as a you know international community, as a global community, I think we need to remember that that this weight is on a lot of survivors, and we need to, as allies, we need to step up and work to kind of shift a bit of that weight off of the survivors who have already been through so much. Um, and that that comes by being an effective ally and fighting these fights for, for survivors. Yeah, I think that's a really important point um, uh, for survivors of any genocide. And, and I think that that really came out um, and I recommend if anybody hasn't seen it, the documentary called On Her Shoulders. Um, about Nadia and, and this fight and, and yeah, just how taxing and draining that can be. And I think that shows it really, really well. All right, well, we wanna thank you so much for your time with us once again. Um, I think that everybody can learn so much from this. And again, as Colleen expressed, the, the um, necessity of using this in our classrooms um, and teaching our students about this genocide. And, and um, as you just pointed out, Olivia, the advocacy work that, that we all can do as well, so important to keep in mind. So thank you everybody for joining us. We will make the recording available afterwards. Um, Kate just put the link for the film in the chat box. And um, Olivia and Abid, if you wouldn't mind staying on, we just wanted to chat with you for a minute um, about some EIHR kind of issues with you. Hopefully Thank we're you, not everybody. in trouble. No, <laughs> not issues. Yes, connections, I should say. Poor choice of words. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And Emily, I saw that you joined us late, so I will send you the recording for this. Kate, did you want to just join me here yes. or? Uh, yeah. Emily, if you want to sign off, like I said, I will send you the recording for this. Yeah. Oops. Oh, Casey.
Okay, how are you? Okay, Hi, Casey. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Oh, great. So, uh, so the webinar actually just concluded, but Kim has the recording and she'll send you. The Got the time wrong. Darn it. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> okay. So time zones are confusing. <laughs> yeah. We can see you. you. Yeah. Yeah, likewise. I'll be sure to watch it. Great. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Good to see you. Can you send me the link, maybe? Okay, that would be better. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because I can't. Let me see if I can. Hang on one second, you guys. Yeah, there we go. Oh, no. No, it won't report. Okay. All right. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you both for, for having two webinars. Um, I think we're finding that a lot of people are recording them and watching later. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that we'll get a lot of feedback. Uh, I think it's such a great discussion and I know a lot of people are going to get a great deal out of this. Um, and I think you know, I don't know that this came up in the chat box. So we're here because we had our board retreat this weekend. Um, so we've, we're just coming out of a lot of deep discussion about, you know, the next five years and, you know, what we all envision and so on and so forth. Um, and I know that, you know, this has been a long-term relationship, Abed, going back to um, Elizabeth's living room in New York in, what, 2016 or something. Um, and we're really invested in, in supporting and elevating your work in whatever way we can, as I think we talked about when we first had this conversation about the webinars. So uh, we would love for you to you know, consider us um, available to you for whatever you need. If you're working on educational materials, if you need us to help you write curriculum, if you need us to help you pilot curriculum that you already have, um, anything along those lines, we would love to be uh, you know, involved in, in, a, in a, possibly even in a more formal partnership con um, configuration. Um, just to um, give that some thought and let us know what you think. Uh, but, you know, we have just such deep respect for the, the fact that you've created this organization um, and that this provides such a terrific platform to, uh, for teachers to, to use with students, and particularly the resources that you put together. Um, but, you know, our reach also is global. And, and those, those things that what really spoke to me with, from what you were saying was the, the, the loneliness and the, and the weight on survivors. And we see that in all the settings where we have teachers connecting with one another. Um, and part of our mission moving as it has been, but, but as we get greater capacity, uh, we really do wanna be focusing on, on creating community between particularly teacher survivors, but not just teachers and looking for ways that women in Bosnia, women in Rwanda, survivors of the Holocaust who were subjected to, you know, a, to similar um, horrific treatment, you know, how might they support one another and how might we uh, make sure that students and teachers are, are aware, learning how to advocate uh, and, and be full participants in, frankly, not to oversimplify, but making the world a better place. So, um, you know, I'm glad to hear your thoughts. I've been chatting for a long time there. Abed, you with us? Can't see you. Oh, yes, yes. Um, sorry, I just turned off my uh, uh, camera because it's uh, getting dark here and this light is. Uh, um, Kate, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to, to know you. And yes, uh, we connected early on. And thank you so much for uh, your continued support, um, uh, and especially these two webinars. Uh, organizing them, uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, when it comes to the education side, Olivia and I work on the programs together and we have another person, uh, they will for sure reach out to you, Olivia, um, as we 
are, you know, we've built a lot of rebuilt a lot of schools and new ones too. And I think we're going to continue to focus on education as a uh, major yep. part of our work and continue to then focus on the other activities around uh, these schools now that we've built a lot of schools. So I am sure there will be opportunities where we can uh, collaborate around uh, these projects. Uh, but again, thank you for organizing these webinars and, and helping us spread the message and, and awareness. And uh, Kate, um, in the beginning of January is usually when Abed and I like take stock of what's ha gonna be happening for the coming year. Um, so we'll be doing that after the holidays. And I think then we'll have like a really good idea of how we could sp like specifically partner. We'll reach back out to you and then we can start like crafting an MOU and, and figuring out the details. Perfect. That sounds great. Because the kind of thing that I have in mind is, uh, it's it sounds to me as if you all are completely on top of the educational needs of the of the Yazidi diaspora or those in refugees that, um, locations and so forth. Um, what I where I think we might be of use is uh, if you were, for example, if you were going to write some lesson plans to accompany Nadia's book or lesson plans that are more about public awareness, about engagement and um, of students globally, not just in the US, Canada, Europe. Um, you know, Rwandan teachers and Bosnia teachers want to know, uh, you know, what's happened as well. So it's, it's more about your work and about you know, that advocacy piece to the extent that creating lesson plans and making them available is going to support what you do and, and give you a broader audience. That's probably where we would be, but, but I'm open to hearing other ideas. I just, that seems like the most obvious. No, I, I, I think that's great. And, and we, we also need to, Ab and I need to think, think through that more clearly, but I think that's, that's would be amazing. We'd love to do, we're, we're trying to do more of that now. Um, and I do think there is potentially an avenue of, uh, for collaboration specific to Sinjar as well, because as Abed said, we, we've been rebuilding, building brand new, these schools, but now we're kind of also expanding beyond that. We're do, we've done a lot of libraries and like re programs connected to like improving uh, reading habits among Yazidi youth because that helps them with their trauma. Um, it's all connected, of course, right? So I, I think there's potentially two avenues we could collaborate on. Um, and let's let's plan to definitely touch base in, in January um, when we when Abin and I have had time to think through this. And yeah, don't feel rushed. This is, we're still gonna be here. So take the time you need. I know you've got a lot on your plate. We'll still be here. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you both so much also from my side. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoy what's left of your good weekend. Good holiday. Yes, Thank and you. I know you have a major holiday coming up, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both ladies. Have a good Bye. rest of your day. You too. Bye.